We are going live and it should show up in our Zoom. Yes, we are. Oh, there we are. Okay. Let me get switched back over. I get it pulled up on my phone so I can see when the comments come in and then I will get to introducing everybody. There we go. Okay. Got a couple people tuned in. I think most of our um, audience typically comes in like and watches afterwards and then they'll post questions and then we can go back in and answer them from there. So, all right, so we're live on Facebook. Hi everyone. Um, it's Samantha again with the NBLD project back with another Facebook live for you guys. Appreciate everyone for joining in with us each month as we do these. And this week we have a very special guest with us. Um, this is Dr. Susan Blumberg and she currently is living and working in Denver, Colorado. She's a life coach with a background in CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. She's also the mother of two twice exceptional children. Yay, no tongue twister. <laughs> and for over 20 years, she's worked in the mental health um, industry with both agencies and private practices and the government. Um, so she's got a lot of experience and background and we're very excited to have her with us today. Um, she is a member of the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates and has sat on both sides of the IEP table as both a parent and a professional. So if you're a parent tuning in, um, she has been where you've been and she's been in your shoes and she has dealt with the IEPs on both sides. Um, and if you're a professional tuning in or if you're a parent wondering what it's like for a professional, she's got <laughs> a perspective on both sides there. So I think that's really great. Um, she's also helped, um, she's a co-author of multiple books, including Fighting for Your Marriage, 12 Hours to a Great Marriage, and Parenting a Child with Sensory Processing Disorder. So like I said, she lives in Denver, Colorado. So I know we have a lot of people that ask about Colorado. So <laughs> we have some resources for us there. We're on the East Coast in New York City. So sometimes we don't always know about other parts of the country and the resources and the professionals that are available there. So we've got someone in the middle of the country now that can help us with some of that. And today she's gonna be addressing a couple different topics, but most likely um, focusing on like social skills, social confidence, friendship, that kind of stuff. So um, she currently is providing life coaching and special education advocacy for children, parents, and families. So I'm gonna actually hand this over to her, let her tell you a little bit more about her background, who she is and how she got to where she is today before we hop into today's topics. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, anything that you wanna ask or you want us to address at the end, leave those in the comments. We'll be sure to get to those at the end. If you're tuning in after the live ends, go ahead and still leave your comments and we'll check on those throughout the next few days as well. All right, so I'm handing this over to you, Dr. Blumberg, if you wanna tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today, why you're doing what you're doing, that kind of background information. Thank you so much, Samantha. I'm so thrilled to be here. So I actually call myself these days a parenting and family well-being coach. And I use those terms because I think what I really want to do is help families work on healthy communication, structure, and lifestyle choices to achieve harmony in their lives. And I use that phrase, harmony in your lives, because I think so much of us just feel there's so much conflict in our homes right now. And yet there are things we can do, skills and strategies that we can learn, whatever our child's situation is, whether your child is identified with a disability or not, that we can learn new skills and strategies to help our families be more at peace. And so that is what I've been doing for the last five years after I stopped being a licensed clinical psychologist. I just like the coaching part of it better, helping families along their journey. Now, I've been working with NLD for over 30 years which is unusual for most people because it's a diagnosis 
that as all of us know, is not as well known as many others because it's not in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And I've worked with considerably over a hundred people with NLD. And then my own child at age six was diagnosed with NLD when the school psychologist was doing her triennial review in kindergarten and discovered, as we all know, that typical verbal and nonverbal split. One of the three diagnostic criteria for NLD. And so I was, as many of us are, totally surprised. And again, like many of us are, my child was also found to be profoundly gifted. And so my child is what's called twice exceptional. A child who is gifted in any arena, could be intellectual, creative, music, art, and has a disability label. Any of the 13 categories under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And then four years later, I had a second child who also is later in life at age 10, also found to be twice exceptional. And so this is an area I've come to specialize in, twice exceptional children. And my forthcoming book, which I hope will be published by the end of the year, is called Twice Exceptional, Twice Challenged, Parenting Your Unique Child, because this is an area we need a lot of support in. Now, children with NLD who have that typical split can fall anywhere on the bell curve from gifted to, to average, from the middle to the middle, from average to low average. That makes NLD a spectrum, doesn't it? Because we can fall, our children can fall anywhere along that curve. But one of the categories that makes NLD special, in addition to that verbal and nonverbal split, the fine and gross motor challenges, the third area, social skills. And that's where I really want to spend most of my attention today, as you already said, because social skills are just an area where our children may really struggle. But I want to say a phrase that so many of us have heard, I'm sure, which is that once you've seen one child with NLD, you've seen one child with NLD. When you have three categories in which our children can show symptoms. And now we usually add two additional categories as we've done more research. That's executive functioning issues and also emotional dysregulation issues. We can see a real spread in how mildly or severely affected our kids are. But social skills are an area that we might see real problems from a very early age. So what does that actually look like in our children? Well, we're mostly talking about nonverbal social skills. That's what's in the current label. And I know the NVLD Foundation is working really hard to find us a new way to address <laughs> the broad range of issues that our children are dealing with. Um, but in social skills, we're looking at the nonverbal social skills our kids and adults with NLD have difficulty dealing with body language, facial expressions, tone of voice, initiation of social skills, how to read how other people are responding to us when we try to initiate a social interaction. And so all of these problems are making it more and more difficult for us from a very young age to understand how to engage with peers. And so I was working in this field for 10 years um, as a psychologist at that time and as a special education advocate. And I wanna say a couple words about the two different things I was doing before I jump in any further. So as a special education advocate, families hire me to come into schools and negotiate for the best possible special education services that our children deserve. Well, first, that's not what the law says we're entitled to. The law says we're entitled to a free and appropriate public education. That doesn't mean we're entitled to the best possible services. Wanna make that point. But when someone hires me to be the advocate, I tell the family, 
My job is to get the best possible services I can negotiate for within the constraints of the law. But NLD makes that hard because it's not in the DSM and it's not listed in IDEA. But we have an advantage, don't we? Because our kids struggle with dyscalculia. Math is one of those visual spatial skills that our kids frequently struggle with. Dysgraphia, fine motor skills, including handwriting, is one of the skills that our kids struggle with. Executive functioning difficulty is one of those skills that our kids struggle with. And social skills, all of those things are covered under IDEA and allow me as an advocate to get social, to get services for your children under IDEA as an advocate. So if NLD is your child's primary diagnosis, please reach out to an advocate. Samantha mentioned that I'm a me member of COPA, the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates, and that organization COPA.org has a directory of advocates all across the country. And you can find somebody local in your area to help you with this in the school setting. Okay, so you said that website is www.copaa.org. Okay, I'm putting that in the comments for anybody that wants to see that. I'm, I'm not typing anything else. I'm just putting the website URL so that you can click on that. So you're saying that that website um, would have a directory of advocates throughout the US that can help parents. That's amazing because we've definitely had people ask about that before and you know, we really didn't know where to send them or how to help them with that. So that is a, a great resource. The second place to look for advocates is www w-r-i-g-h-t-s-l-a-w.com, rightslaw.com. Okay. Pete and Pam Wright are the author of a book that I recommend to every client I work with. And their book is called From Emotions to Advocacy. And it is the go-to book on parent advocacy. It explains the laws, it explains the testing, and it explains how parents can be better advocates for their kids. And they also have a directory on their website of advocates across the country. You'll find me on both directories. And I do work across the country by Zoom, and I did that even before the pandemic. Um, so the important thing to know is you parents should never attend an IEP or 504 meeting alone. Always go with someone, even if it's just a neighbor or a friend who takes notes for you. Because when we're there, and now I'm going to talk about being a parent of a kid on an IEP, I never went to a meeting alone, and I'm a professional in the field. I worked in this field for 10 years before I went to my first IEP meeting with my own daughter, and I still always brought someone else with me because you're emotional when you're the parent. That's your kid they're talking about. You always need a backup, even if it's just the person who's taking notes and might hear something that you missed because you're feeling emotional about your kid. That's good advice. So back to NLD. Now, we want to talk about friendships. I have to say, my child not being able to develop friendships is probably the thing that broke my heart more than any other part of her disability. She's 25 now, and she has autism in addition to having NLD. And I have to say that double whammy has been very difficult for me. She also carries three other diagnostic labels. She has Tourette syndrome, panic disorder, and sensory processing disorder. It has been quite a roller coaster over the course of her life. I have to say that even though she is profoundly gifted, that has been a help in many ways, but it has been its own challenge as well, getting her the proper supports and services at both ends of the spectrum. But the NLD had its own challenges. She struggled with math early on until we got her the pro proper supports and tutoring. But the social skills, the social skills have been a challenge. 
I want to talk about some approaches to social skills that I think that I think are particularly appropriate for our kids. But first, again, let's talk about what are the issues. We've already talked about the nonverbal skills that are particularly difficult for our kids. Body language, tone of voice, facial expressions. We didn't yet talk about sarcasm, not understanding sense of humor, puns. Our kids are literal. They're black and white thinkers. That's part of what comes along with this particular disability. My daughter says she only understands sarcasm from me <laughs> because she's learned to read me over the course of our lives together. She doesn't really get it from other people. And as I suspect some of you have experienced, she calls me her translator. I translate the rest of the world for my daughter, and I always have. She has to learn to trust somebody, and in our family, it's me, to help her make sense of the rest of the world. She's very literal. She's very concrete. She's very much a black and white thinker. And for my daughter, that translated into wanting to be a scientist. She wanted to learn genetics and biology, and that's what she specialized in. Because she is profoundly gifted, she was placed in gifted and talented magnet schools. Colorado was one of only 27 states that have mandated and funded GT schooling. 14 other states have some form of enrichment programs. But if you add that up, that still leaves eight states that have nothing at all. And that is not sufficient for kids like ours. What also happens though, even for kids who are in the 68% of children who are in the average range, it means that they have deficits in math. They have deficits in handwriting. They have deficits in executive functioning, which my daughter does as well. That means they need additional accommodations and supports to just be able to manage in school. And when you add the inability to understand a teacher who is not being explicit and literal in their descriptions, maybe they're saying so sarcastically, are you ready to start now, Susan? I'm going to say no not understanding that what the teacher is telling me, start now, Susan, because they haven't said it explicitly. So our social skills are not just about friendships, but about understanding directions from teachers, understanding directions from us as parents. It affects every aspect of our lives. So back to social skills. I wanna introduce a particular social skills approach that I believe is particularly helpful for our kids. And it's by Michelle Garcia Winner and her social thinking approach. Her website, Samantha, are you ready? Is www.socialthinking.com. Easy enough. <laughs> it is, <laughs> isn't it? And she talks about social competence. Okay. It's not just social skills but it's social awareness plus social skills, which builds social competence. And her social thinking approach, um, which you can both find workshops for, I'm trained in those workshops, there are many of us across the country, and thank goodness, many speech language pathologists in schools offer this curriculum. And I want you to be aware that when your child is offered a social skills group in a school setting, that you are entitled to ask what curriculum is that social group, skills group offering? And if it is not an evidence-based social skills group, you're entitled to refuse it. Because a social skills quote unquote group that says, we're gonna play games and teach you how to do turn-taking, or it's a bunch of ADHD boys who are restless, that's not necessarily the best place for your NLD child. You want a evidence-based program. Social thinking is only one. There are others, but that's the one I'm gonna talk about in the limited time I have today. 
That is one of the most evidence-based programs available. So what does it teach? What it teaches is how to use your body and your thinking to be able to develop both social awareness and social skills to develop what she calls, what Michelle Garcia Winter calls, social competence. It means paying attention, not just to your own feelings, but what are other people in the group doing? Can you pay attention to the cues other people are giving you and how to read those cues so that you can become more socially competent? It's a very important approach because it's not enough to just teach a kid to learn how to take turns. It's not enough to just teach a kid to say, will you play with me? Because what do we do when another kid says no? I want to give an example. My daughter was going to an after school program um, when she was in third grade. And we walked into the after school program and another kid jumped up from their table and said there were laundry tubs where you put your backpacks. And this child in the most friendly way possible said, my backpack is in that pink tub and I'm sitting at this table. Think about that. I knew that that meant to my daughter, put your backpack in the pink tub and come sit next to me. Did my daughter know that? Does your children know that? No, my daughter had no idea what those two statements meant. So I'm her translator, right? I said to my daughter, Aviva, she means put your backpack in the pink tub and go sit next to her at the table. And then my daughter was able to do that. She had no clue what those two statements meant. She was oblivious because it wasn't black and white. There was no direction. It was simply a statement. My backpack is in the pink tub and I'm sitting at this table. She had no clue what that meant. What it inferred. Yeah, she yeah. wasn't able to infer. Yeah. Our kids can't infer. Yeah. So without direct instruction, our kids are not able to read those cues. So social thinking is a process of learning so social awareness plus social skills. So I hope this was helpful in understanding some of these issues involved in teaching social skills to our kids. And I'm wondering if there are questions that I can answer now, Simon. So I have a couple just based on what you've said as we let some of the other questions come in. Um, so my first question is gonna go back to kind of what you just went through. So you have a professional background, you have training, you've done this, you know, for, 20, 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> what advice would you give to a parent who's an accountant or a doctor mm -hmm. or who doesn't have the training and background knowledge that you do about what situations um, your child might need that interpretation or that help with? Because you pick it up intuitively. How, how would you advise that other parents handle those situations and learn where that interpretation may be needed, I guess. Excellent question. And I actually have an answer, <laughs> <laughs> a couple answers. So the first thing is use your own intuitive knowledge about social situations, okay? And so when you see a social situation that you understand, role model that for your child. So, if you would, in this same situation, okay, you walk into a social situation, you go to a cocktail party. We used to go to cocktail parties, your know, dinner parties before the pandemic, right? And you walk into a social situation and the hostess says to you, you know, I'd like you to meet so-and-so, right? And you know that means you should say to so-and-so, hi, my name is Susan, very nice to meet you. How do you know our hostess? You know to say that because you've been to lots of dinner parties, right? Your kid wouldn't know what to say when your hostess introduces you to someone. 
So draw on your own social experience. That's the first step. Just do what comes naturally to you because you know it doesn't come naturally to your child. Okay. Don't be scared of that. <laughs> Use your own social experience as a person. That feels safe to do that. The second thing, and this is a wonderful thing to do, watch TV with your kid. Watch a video with, a kid, with your kid that's age appropriate for your kid. So you can watch, um, you know, uh, Disney Plus. You can watch Nickelodeon if it's a younger kid. Watch something appropriate with your middle school age kid. And stop the show when there's a social interaction and ask your kid what happened. Okay. Replay a social interaction that you see on TV and talk it over with your child. It's hugely helpful. So my daughter's favorite TV show for a long time was Bones. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that, but Dr. Temperance Brennan, who's a forensic anthropologist, has autism. Um, you know, what we used to call Asperger's because she's very verbal, but it, what we would now call level one ASD. And she is very severely impaired uh, socially. And she has a best friend named Angela, who is her interpreter. Are you familiar with the show, Samantha? I've seen that show, yeah, I love it. I think okay, it's so Angela does what I do for my daughter. She says to her, no, you <laughs> blew that interaction. And she talks her through those social interactions, right? Mm -hmm. And so my daughter and I would watch those interactions and then we would talk them over and say, okay, what did Dr. Brennan do wrong? And what is Angela telling her to do correctly? So by watching it on TV, we were able to practice those interactions. And so by watching an age appropriate TV show with your child, yeah. You get to practice those interactions and see how to do it correctly. And it's hugely helpful. It. Yeah. Talk yeah. to them and have that conversation so that you know if they understand and then you understand if they understand. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. It's That's fabulous. Cool. And your kid gets to watch the video and you're there to talk it through and be their translator. Yeah. If they're younger, so say like in the six or seven or even up to like 10 when they're still going places with you, because it's much easier if they're younger and they're going somewhere where their parents are with them. Um, if a parent is still struggling to kind of understand what situations would like, a, if they're holding your hand and they don't know what to do in a situation, if they squeeze your hand or could there be like some kind of signal as well? Absolutely. And you can make a, a verbal cue as well. So yeah. if your child is uncomfortable in a situation, you can make up a silly word. <laughs> so the silly word could be petticoat or umbrella yeah. or silly putty. And when your child says that word, you know they're feeling overloaded and you can remove them from the situation. I'm gonna step away for half a second. No worries. I want to show you something. So Sesame Street has introduced a couple of years ago, a character with you autism hang on, hang on, hang on. and you can remove. Sorry, I somehow got the audio pulled up on our Facebook Live trying to read comments. Keep going, sorry. And they made a, a book called Circle of Friends which is about their character, Julia, who has autism. And they have a, and they have a whole series of videos and um, daily routine cards and activities and printables and a narrated version of this storybook that would be hugely helpful for younger children with NLD who have social issues. So you can go to sesamestreet.org slash autism. Oh, cool. And they have all kinds of social stories for even younger children that three to six year old age. Oh, cool. Okay. That's awesome. Um, sorry, I 
was trying to read comments. It was pulling up our audio, which is on a lag. And so I didn't want that to be in the background. I wanted to make sure everyone could hear that. So I'm trying to figure out how to get back to comments really quick. No problem. That, okay. So um, that's awesome. I think um, Sesame Street has really come up with a lot of cool new characters to really show how different everyone is. And that, you know, I, I know growing up we had like, four different characters or something. I think it's great the way they have really evolved and yes, and started doing all that. Okay, yes. okay, so we are starting to get some questions rolling in. So let me get to those. Um, all right, so let's stick with the social skills questions really quick. I have actually, so I had a 72 year old who's watching um, and I believe he has NVLD, which is why I made the same, but he didn't understand the bucket story when you were telling it. The bucket story? Uh, the pink bucket and the table. Oh. Yeah, right. so, I, so I think he was saying he even didn't understand that and he's 72, which I thought right. was, was really interesting. Um, I have someone, and we get this question all the time, but social skills help for adults. So yes. parents aren't there with you all the time. You're on your own. Um, where would you recommend besides, you know, doing the therapy as younger and like trying to find social skills online and there are social skill groups online. What would you recommend for adults? Uh, Michelle Garcia Winner works with adults. Okay. And that's the one with the social thinking website, correct? Socialthinking.org. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Um, and then, so I had someone ask, would an interpersonal communicator be a good person to teach social skills? I, I hope I got that question right because I can't see it anymore. Yeah, I'm not sure what an interpersonal communicator is. Um, I've never heard that term. Um, speech language pathologists who are trained in pragmatic language skills is someone that I often refer people to. Um, that's who works with children in school settings and some do work with adults. I don't know what an interpersonal communicator is. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that and maybe get back to the person that made that comment um and i've completely lost our facebook comments but i'm going to keep going with the ones i have and my team will be sending me other new ones as they come in um okay this is a good question so a little bit different than like inferring in social situations this person wants to know how and also who is teaching inference regarding academics so i assume my interpretation of that question would be like in the classroom when the parents yes. are there and teachers may not be as familiar yes it's an excellent question so if my daughter for example in high school um, we had an iep goal for her to work in small group settings and learn to take different roles. So my daughter, for example, was very bossy and would always want to tell all the other kids in her small group what to do for any task they were working on. And because she didn't understand the social cues, she was unable to read other kids reactions to how she was behaving and so her case manager um, who specialized in pragmatic language and affective needs she it was a special um, program in her high school worked with her on there are curricula that you can work with on learning to take different roles and so we worked with her that in any given small group she was assigned a different role. So in one assignment, she might be the group leader, but in another assignment, she might be the note taker. And in another assignment, she might be the researcher. And in another assignment, um, she might be the person who wrote the PowerPoint. And in another assignment, I don't know, she had some other role. Yeah. And by assigning her different tasks in each group assignment, she learned to take different roles. And this was hugely helpful to her in learning to play different academic roles and helping her 
uh, learn to control her need to always be the boss. Gotcha. And we actually wrote that as an IEP goal in high school in her IEP. That's awesome. So going back to the IEP meetings then. So what we've found and what we know and are very familiar with is that most teachers and professionals and especially school personnel are just not familiar with NBLD. They've never heard of it. They've never been taught about yes. it. It's not in their textbooks. And I, so I was a teacher as well for a couple of years um, and I had never heard of it before this. We're, we're taught very basic information as general education teachers. How do you explain, and, and we did an educational pamphlet that's on our website, but how as a parent, would you recommend explaining or teaching these teachers a, about NBLD and what your child needs and, and that kind of stuff? I can answer that every single year that uh, my daughter started school, and I recommend this to all my clients, and I do this at the IEP team meeting for every client I have with NLD. I provide two articles to every teacher, and we often hold, separate from the IEP meeting, a team meeting with all the teachers. And by the time my daughter was in high school, she led those meetings. And the two articles that I provide are old articles, but are still valuable because I haven't found anything to replace them. And they're both by Sue Thompson, who wrote in 1995, a groundbreaking book called The Source Book for Nonverbal Learning Disability. But she has two articles and I will provide them to anyone who asks. I'll give my contact information in a moment. Um, and the two articles, one is called Nonverbal Learning Disability, and the other is called Meant for Teachers, Neurobehavioral Characteristics in the Classroom. It is an article meant for teachers, and it is, gives specific strategies broken down by characteristics of NLD, specific teaching strategies for NLD students. And I provide that article to every teacher who has ever worked with my daughter and any client that I work with who has NLD, specific teaching strategies for NLD students. And I give that to every teacher of NLD clients that I have had in 20 years. It is an excellent breakdown with specific teaching strategies. Okay, that sounds really similar to kind of what we had come up with Winston Prep. Um, in our, our presentation that we created. So it's a PDF, but it also comes with audio as a presentation if people wanna to listen to it as well. And it kind of breaks it down into different categories and then specifically inside of each category, what are different, um, not accommodations, but just different teaching styles and tips and helps, uh, right. tips and tricks right. on, on that. Right, so this, this isn't accommodations. This is actual okay. teaching strategies. Okay. I also have a document of three pages long of accommodations and modifications, oh, cool. um, which I developed using Sue Thompson's material. And all of this is available on the NLD Facebook page that I am the admin for. And that page is NLD dash nonverbal learning disorder, not disability disorder. Um, and so on that page where you can reach me, NLD dash nonverbal learning disorder, um, all of these articles are available in our files. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm just trying to go through, I'm getting a couple more by text, so I'll get to those in just a second. Um, I think that's all I had written down prior to this. So let me go through the messages from my team and see what I've got. Of course. Okay, I think we actually have touched on most of these. Am I missing anything? Let me see if I can pull them up on my end again, too. While you're looking, can I say a few more things about adults with NLD? Yes, go for it. 
So our group is both for adults with NLD and for parents of kids with NLD. And I wanna say a few words, you mentioned a 72 year old. We have a lot of adults in our group who are not diagnosed until they're in their 30s, 40s and 50s. And we have adults on our page who are married, who are respiratory therapists, social workers, writers, um, people who have had full and fulfilling careers. Um, as a matter of fact, we have a gentleman on our page who is a statistician, um, obviously overcame his math issues. And he has written a wonderful book. His name is Peter Flom, F-L-O-M. And he has a blog um, called I Am Learning Disabled. And he wrote a book of his essays called Screwed Up But Somehow Not Stupid that I highly recommend both to adults with NLD and to parents. He is a highly successful person. My daughter is 25 now. She has a BS in biology and she's completing pastry school. And she's going to be a gluten-free and allergen-free pastry chef. Um, and I think we need to know, I've met um, a law professor at Yale. I know this gentleman who's a statistician. I know a woman who was a respiratory therapist, another woman who was a social worker. I want you to know that your children will grow up and be able to have fulfilling lives and careers. When my daughter was six and diagnosed, when she was eight and started having panic attacks, when she was nine and got her autism diagnosis, when she was in sixth grade and was physically attacked by another child and I had to pull her out of public school for a couple of years, I didn't know that she was going to be able to be successful in life. And yet now I do know that with the proper accommodations and supports, with the right teaching interventions, with our support as parents, our children can grow up to have fulfilling and successful lives. And that's a message I really want parents who are listening this to hear. Um, so we actually had a question. Someone wanted to know how your daughter was doing now, ah. like you answered that. So, um, yeah, we get a lot of questions about adults and, and unfortunately there are a lot of resources and research that is really geared towards children because until it's in the DSM and we repeat this all the time until it's in the DSM, which is based on research that typically happens with children we don't have the resources to provide to adults. And, and I'm trying to say this really carefully until it's in the DSM and it's recognized, there's no funding to develop more research or to do more research or to develop some of these things because people aren't being taught about it. So unfortunately right now, it, and we get this a lot. There is a lot out there for children. There is a lot of focus on children. That's why we try to talk about adults and we try to come up with questions and resources and that kind of stuff. And I know there's a little bit in the comments about that. Um, you know, all of, all of our Facebook lives are on different topics. I do want to throw that out there. Some of them are based on children only. Some of them we try to talk about both. Some are specifically for adults. So if you're an adult watching this, looking for more information about adults and resources for that, I would encourage you to check out some of our other Facebook lives. But so you're you're telling us that your daughter's doing well. She's yes. obviously, um, you know, going going back to school and has found her passions and stuff. How is she doing socially? Unfortunately, between the combination of NLD and autism, my daughter is not able to develop peer relationships. And that is an ongoing sadness for me, but she is um, right now really focused on developing her career path. She does have a job at a bakery, gluten-free bakery um, that will be starting in April when she completes school. And we're very excited because she will be able to support herself. Um, we're not clear whether she'll be able to live independently because of the Tourette syndrome. Um, because she does, um, it does cause some risks to her. She has pretty severe muscular tics and um, it could put her in some position of danger if she's 
you know, if there's a, the stove is on or she's holding something hot or, you know, she, she freezes up physically. And so we're not sure if she'll be able to live independently, perhaps with a roommate in the future. Yeah. But she herself is gluten-free because of her Tourette's and we have found that it does help. Um, but at the moment, we're really focused on her finding her career path. I, I do encourage adults with NLD to join our page because we are 50% adults with NLD on our page and it's a great source of support. And as I said, we have adults of all ages on our page and they share all kinds of supports and resources with each other. It's one of the few pages that focuses on adults. That's awesome. Um, and I know we're getting a couple comments about asking for us to repeat information. So we'll go through the video at the end and answer those questions to find out exactly what you're needing us to repeat or give you the name of a book or whatever it is. We'll go through in just a little bit um, over the next few days, get all of those answered as well. Cause I know we've missed a couple and I think and you can also, again, go on the NLD page that I admin and ask me directly. Yeah, definitely. And um, we also have the Inspire page. So if you're on Facebook, but you want a little more anonymity. Anonymity. You want to be anonymous. <laughs> I'm like, you're <laughs> tongue tied today. Um, if you want to be a little more anonymous, have a little more privacy versus the Facebook group with your picture and your name. Um, Inspire, which is linked on our website, is a way to do that as well without necessarily having all that information out there if that makes you feel a little more comfortable. And the Inspire page also addresses some of these same topics. So you can always hop on there. There's multiple groups online, it sounds like. So I would maybe just kind of connect and plug into each of them because there may be different people in each group, different topics, different threads going on. Um, so that definitely can't hurt. And repeating the name of, of your page, I think they're talking about the Facebook one. It's NLD dash nonverbal learning disorder is the one that they're, she's talking about on Facebook. Um, and then, so we're gonna wrap up with this question. Do you have any recommendations for a student that's finishing college um, and in the job search and the transition into post-education life? It's a great question. So I do work personally as a coach with people in that stage of life. So you're welcome to reach out to me and book a free call to talk about some suggestions for that. So you can reach out to me on the NLD page or at Dr. Susan Coaching is my professional Facebook page. And I'd be happy to talk to your student. In terms of other help, the the really important thing is to think about what your student's passion is. Where are their interests? Because, you know, as Temple Grandin, who's one of the most famous autistic people we know, she says, find your passion and make that your work life. So what's the thing your student is the most interested in? What are they going to feel happiest going to work for? And that's the kind of job they should have. But given the restrictions of how your NLD may be affecting you, some coaching around how to do job interviews, how to write your resume, how to role model and practice those interviews. A good coach, somebody like me or another life coach who has some experience with NLD can absolutely smooth the road for you to have a more successful job hunting experience. Awesome. And you said that you do virtual sessions as well. You've been doing that since before the pandemic and they, yes. they can sign up for those or schedule one of those on your website. Do you have a website? My website. Yep. My website is drsusanblumberg.com. Couldn't be easier. I'm going to go ahead and type that one in right now, just in case it's DR, right? Yep. And I'm happy to book a free consult call to see if I can help you. Good, awesome. So like I said, if we didn't get to your question or if you needed us to repeat or retype anything, we will work on that over the next few days, um, getting those questions answered. Again, we do Facebook Lives. We're trying to get back to where we're doing them once a month with different 
topics and different professionals. We even had our ambassadors on last week who were all adults within VLD that were talking about their story as well. So I encourage you to check out all of our past Facebook Lives if this one wasn't specifically what you were looking for. We're trying to cover all different topics. If you ever have an idea for us or want us to, to talk about something specifically, we will do our best to find a professional to cover that. Just send us an email or a message to let us know what you're interested in. And I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Blumberg, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge as a parent and a professional and someone who is has been working with um, people with NVLD for, what did you say, over 30 years? 30 years. 30 years. That's honestly amazing. I took a lot of notes today. <laughs> I've been writing the whole time um, just with different things that you know we've talked about here as an organization and things we've talked about with other professionals and then just getting your input and opinion and, and point of view as well. I think it's been really wonderful. And if you have a last word or piece of advice or whatever it is that you can leave us with today, that would be really great. I think, I, I wanna say something, yes. I attended a workshop on how to have a joyful life with a children, child with special needs when my daughter was struggling around puberty when she was 11. And I wrote a mission statement that I've been carrying around ever since. She was 11 then and she's 25 now. And I'm going to read you my mission statement for everyone to hear. Aviva is capable of having a fulfilling and high quality life on her own terms. I will tell her that I believe she can achieve what she wants to. All of our children can do that. So true, that's, that's amazing. And you've had that for, oh my gosh, I'm like tearing up, um, for what, 14 years? 14 years. You've carried that around with you, that's awesome. Um, again, thank you so much. If you're watching this after we end our live, please leave more comments, questions. We will try to get to all of those and check out our website. I've put it in the comments, but it's drsusanblumberg.com. She's got some Facebook groups. Reach out to her if you are looking for some help and, and you know need that support. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.